It's uh, Michigan has been like a, a big part of our story from the very start. With one of our first ever like house shows outside of um, Nashville was in, in Grand Rapids, so I feel like they'll be back. So thanks for having us, Google. And um, th this first song is uh, it's one of our. I guess it's come out about five months ago, and um, it's kind of written out of this place of like this emotional like roller coaster of a year I went through last year. Um, 2016 was just kind of like high, super high highs and super low lows for me. First nephew was born, and I just kind of like wasn't prepared for like the emotional reaction that I would have, just like this pulse of joy. Um, and about a month after that, my grandpa was very close to kind of just suddenly pass away, and um, so it was just kind of like a big bummer. So it was just kind of like this beautiful thing happened, and then this, you know, really sad thing happened. And um, I don't know, it's just like things like that happen in a person's life, and it kind of makes you think about like your life and like what you're doing life and what the heck would I even tell this like little human being that came on the earth about life because um, I don't know what the heck you know um, and kind of like the general synopsis that I got was that you can control certain things in your life and you don't have control over other things and odds are you should probably do something about the things you can control um, and with our music we really like want to implore people to like go out and live the life that you want and like be full of life um, it's the one that we got. So, um, this one's called Satan Jacket. Also, I know 401 pays are great. Uh, we, we get tweets all the time. Like, oh, actually, 401 pays are amazing. It's like, I know it's not the purpose of the song. So, when you hear that line, don't judge me. <laughs> Thank you. 
That was great, like amazing too. I feel like our Detroit shows are kind of showing this as well. But um, like people in the South just like are crazy at live shows, especially when there's a banjo. Like uh, <laughs> you know, that was a redneck joke, but uh, it, it's like it's just like we like to have fun at our live shows. And our first show in um, Sweden was at this like small like cafe pub thing, and there was there was like we were. Surprise! It's like our first. It's after our first record. You know, it was like 400 people showed up in this very small town in Sweden, and we were like, "This is gonna be awesome." And uh, a- after our set, we like got back, um, like in the green room area, and we were like, "We suck!" <laughs> like nobody. Like we're not like translating internationally. Blah blah. blah. We're like, we need to quit. And then um, we, we all of a sudden start hearing like clapping, like. And all of a sudden, like, 400 people in this small cafe were, like, clapping in unison. And that's how they call for an encore in, in Sweden. And um, we, we finish the song, go back out, call for another encore. It's like, we're a young band. We don't know too many songs past our set list. <laughs> and um, anyway, so we kind of found out that, like, you know, in Sweden, people are just, like, shy or more bashful. You know, it's like they, the way they come to shows is they're just going to listen. And they're going to clap. And they're not going to be, like, standing up and, like, jumping around or whatever. So um, I don't know where I was going with that story. All I was saying is that you were louder than that, that crowd. <laughs> that, that makes us feel a lot better, <laughs> more secure with what we're doing up here. So I appreciate that. Um, but we, after that tour, we, we did a tour in the winter. And um, if you know Sweden in the winter, it's like the sun comes out, like, one hour of the day if you're lucky. And um, it was just, like, this beautiful, like, we did, like, 28 shows in, like, 30 days or something in, in the winter. And it was just kind of this beautiful, like, overwhelming tour. Um, and then we went back in the summer, and it's the complete opposite in the summer. The sun sets at, like, midnight, comes right back up. Like, people are, like, walking their babies by the river at 11 o'clock, like, sipping on a beer. It's like, you have to go to sleep sometime. So it's just, like, this very, very, like, polar opposite country. It's just, it feels like a different country uh, when we went there in the summer. Um, so we kind of fell in love with Sweden, in particular Stockholm, and uh, we wrote a song about Stockholm in the summer. So that's the song. I just got to Stockholm, and I'm walking on a stone. It's the middle of July, and I don't know if I'll ever make it home. If I'll
traditional bluegrass instruments. I don't know if you guys know. I'm from Chicago. I didn't know what a mandolin was until <laughs> I moved to Nashville. So, um, But yeah, me and Nate, um, we all met in college in Nashville, and me and Nate had just kind of picked up these instruments and um, started messing around. Um, and that was around the time that we met Judah. So I guess like bluegrass has a big influence on, on our sound because we play these instruments. But in reality, our um, influences are pretty widespread and like when we were growing up we listened to all kinds of hip-hop and rock and all that so that's more how we play um, but this is a traditional bluegrass song that we like to do it's called little girl of mine in tennessee yeah, yeah if y'all want to stand up and <laughs> square dance and whatever <laughs> we do have a bluegrass stance maybe i should i'll do it for this song <laughs> it's going to be a little awkward, but yeah, I'll do it while we play it. So we, do this, we used to do this thing at our show where Nate, it looks better on Nate because he's got the beard and the banjo, but you just kind of have to like get into athletic position, you know, like you're playing defense in basketball, but you duck feet, you bend down like this, and then you move your feet like that. <laughs> That's the bluegrass position. It's a really, actually, it's a really good leg workout too. So. All right, ready? You good? Yeah, we're good. We're good. <laughs>
broke the string. <laughs> that's that's the one rule for bluegrass, so. Out of tune and breaking strings. Yep. Certain bands with no cure. <laughs> Some people call it a chainsaw. They can turn a chainsaw off. <laughs> as a young band especially just like of like like you know like we did something cool and uh especially like to be on stage with dave and like you know you kind of watch legends as a kid like growing up and you know he's like a legend of himself you know he's kind of the guy for for me at least um that was kind of always on at night or whatever and um it's just kind of funny how like moments like that can happen in like your life and maybe you can relate to this with whatever you do as well um whether it's business or or whatever it's like moments like that can be such a positive thing and have this like great influence on you and they but can also kind of blur like your intentions uh for for us like musically like like i said earlier like we just want to make music that's life-giving to people and hopefully can help people out because that's the way music has been for us and the way we've kind of like to receive music um moments like that happen and success can become more about instagram followers and like selling more tickets and, you know, X and Y, playing more late night TV shows or whatever. And those things have its place for what we do. I mean, of course, they have to pay our bills, but um, if that's what success is, then we're never going to reach success because it doesn't matter if you're Bono or Taylor Swift. You can always sell more tickets and you can always have more Instagram followers. Taylor Swift's doing okay on Instagram followers. <laughs> um, but th this song is just kind of about, like, just kind of in, in simple nature, like, no matter how many people are singing like the banjo or whatever, like we're waking up to the fact that this, this like success is about like us making life giving music for people. So um, thanks so much for coming. I hope everybody has an amazing week, amazing day. Can't wait to be back. This is called Take It All Back. Yeah. 
thanks again to uh, Judah and the Lion for playing a couple songs for us. That was awesome. Let's give them one more round of applause. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you guys. Uh, you know, you guys uh, were at Detroit in Detroit last night, DTE. You guys are heading to Cleveland tomorrow, uh, which is close to my hometown, as we were talking about uh, earlier. Thanks for spending your day off with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, other than drinking coffee at Starbucks and hanging out with uh, tech nerds at Google, what do you guys typically do on a, on a day off? If you weren't coming here, what would you guys be doing this afternoon? <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we're pretty sporty. We, uh, we like to, I don't know if you guys play spikeball or um, can jam or uh, throw the frisbee, so we're kind of trying to just, like, stay active. We're going to run, uh, go get coffee in the city. Um, right. Golf. 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 Yeah, nice. Michigan's great for golf, so if you ever need uh, recommendations next time you come through town, especially over in Grand Rapids, there's some good courses, so let us know. For sure. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we ask hard-hitting questions here at Google, uh, as you saw from that first question. Um, this next one... I ask Google. It, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Spencer, for the reciprocation. We appreciate it. This ad is brought to you by Google. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'll give us talks. <laughs> Nate, Nate, this question is being directed to you guys, or to you, excuse me. Um, true or false, uh, the banjo is the sexiest instrument in a rock band. <laughs> False. <laughs> I like uh, Nate. I've I've read a couple articles where you uh, you kind of classify Judah and the Lion sound as uh, booty popping banjo music. Uh, I I think we got a sense of that. Was was it hard for you guys? You guys are known for your energetic shows, right? So I've seen you guys live before. You guys like to move around a lot on stage. Was it hard for you guys to? Uh, for the most part, sit in stools and play quietly for the most part for us here at Google. If you guys want to jump around with us, we could have done that. <laughs> yeah. Well, being so early in the morning, I think it like kind of balanced it out, but you saw during the third song, like a couple of us wanted to stand up and up, yeah. Yeah, tap the toes a little bit. Can you guys talk? I, I'm sure you've told this story many times, but I think it's really interesting because you guys all come from very distinct backgrounds at different places around the country. Um, but you all bring kind of similar musical tastes that have kind of led to, to what you guys sound like today. Do you guys mind kind of recapping for us here um, kind of where you guys each came from, uh, how you guys met, and then how you guys kind of form uh, the progression of the sound that you guys have today? Yeah, that's for sure. sure. <laughs> um, that's a, that's a three-part question. <laughs> so if you guys can remember all those, that's that's bonus points. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in Chicago, um, started learning on piano. Um, when I was like nine and kind of evolved from there, I picked up guitar and right before I went to college, which is where we met at Belmont, um, I started playing mandolin. So that's kind of my, my story. Yeah, well, well we, all, we all have like, like Spencer grew up playing jazz drums and played marching band, uh, grew up on bands like Boston and uh, like who are some of the other like influences, Chicago, all the cities. Um, <laughs> And then Nate, his, both of his parents were in the Colorado uh, Symphony and uh, grew up, his dad grew up teaching the trumpet and uh, his mom is like this virtuoso piano player um, who taught Nate to play trumpet first and then piano and then, um, but Nate was like this metal punk rock kid growing up and somehow ended up with a banjo. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I grew up like super jockey, like loved basketball and AAU and uh, on my dad's car, like it would be like Eminem, 50 Cent, Run DMC, Tribe Called Quest, that type of stuff. And then my mom's car was more like Tom Petty, REO Speedwagon, REM, Queen, um, those type of sounds. So it's just kind of funny. Uh, and Miles Davis had this quote going into your next question about how we kind of got together. It's like and uh, how our sound form. He said, um, it could take you a lifetime to figure out how you sound. That's not like word for word, but that's kind of the, the general idea of it. It's like... And I think we've discovered, because we met in college, um, kind of randomly at, at a school called Belmont University in Nashville. And um, it was my junior year. I was playing baseball and kind of starting to take, like, uh, riding more seriously, uh, just because I was, I'd always do it, like, since, like, a young kid, but never really, like, recorded anything. And I, I had this idea to record this EP just, like, so my mom would shut up about it, like, just so she would um, 
be satisfied with you know her EP that I was gonna make her. And then uh, I asked Nate. Nate was a friend of my roommates. Uh, Nate and Brian were friends, and then Brian and Spencer were friends. And so it all just kind of like randomly kind of came together. And that the first time we met, I remember um, call my mom. It's kind of like maybe heavy or not heavy, but like emotional. Just like I remember call my mom crying, just like, I think I've found this song, this sound that I really like. Because <laughs> I come from this like really kind of, I didn't know I was a redneck until I moved to Nashville. <laughs> it's like one of those like moments. Uh, and so like I grew up in this town where like banjo and, and mandolin um, were very familiar instruments like for me, but I'd never written music for them. Um, so it was almost like I was like kind of going back to my roots a little bit uh, with the sound. And um, just over the course of time, like we spent uh, so much time in the van uh, traveling and trying to like cultivate our live show and talking about new records and um, just thinking about like that Miles Davis quote of just trying to figure out what Judah and Line sounds like. Um, at, over the course of time when Nate's, you know, doing the auxiliary, you know, chord and DJ in the van playing EDM and like Naked and Famous and Manchester Orchestra and Brian's got it and he's playing Billy Joel and, um, you know, and Spencer's playing Florida Georgia Line <laughs> and uh, Boston, <laughs> Chicago. Uh, and then, you know, like it, it, it like it just like we kind of run the gamut of like influences and uh, we really wanted to make music that wasn't limited by that. Cause this, this day and age, you, Google knows just as good as anybody is that, I mean, with the world we live in, like people have access to all different types of music and most everybody that at least that are fan, maybe are fans of us, like, like all music genres, there might be one or two that you hate, but that's kind of like the general like synopsis. So we wanted to make music that we all liked and enjoyed, but it was like unique to us. Um, that was a bit of a long answer, but that's perfect. Kind of yeah. All the points. Now you mentioned kind of some of this being cultivated in the, the long van trips. You guys did something like 200 some shows or 150 some shows in, in 2015. And that continues. You guys are, are touring a ton. Can you talk a little bit about this current tour and kind of the differences between where you guys are at now? I, I heard that you guys have upgraded the, the van to a bus now. So that's a big step for any band. Uh, so, how it started, you guys were, were touring around in the van doing a ton of shows a year. You guys are now playing DTE, which is absolutely massive. What's that been like for you guys, kind of making that progression from uh, kind of the grassroots touring, uh, DJing your own bus to now, or your own van to now being on these big tour buses, touring around with some, some huge bands? Yeah, mad respect, Cletus, our van. Uh, it's a white Ford 15 passenger. It's parked in Nashville in a parking lot. And uh, yeah, it's, it's so sad. <laughs> 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 no, still it takes us to like the airport from time to time, but um, she needs an oil change, probably like ten thousand miles or whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's been super cool being in a bus. Um, I think it just it just helps our morale, like being able to get eight hours of sleep and um, spread out, have personal space. There's more time in the day because we're driving at night and sleeping. Um, and uh, it's just one less thing to have to think about. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's been, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I have anything more to say about no, that. That's Cle awesome. Cletus lives. I've always wanted to be on a tour bus, but it sounds like Cletus did a pretty good job too for you guys, so that's yeah. awesome. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about your, your new-ish album, so Full Cop and Roll? Um, I read a, a quote from you, Judah. You mentioned, um, and I think I heard too that this album was, was written in, or, or produced in about two weeks that was a very kind of quick turnaround and i also read this this um quotation from you judah that a lot of the songs were written with your live show in mind that you wanted to put a lot of energy into these songs and you wanted them to, to resonate in your live shows you talk about kind of i guess just the process of putting together a record so quickly and then also letting kind of some of your musical influences shine through and, and some of that stage presence as well in the songs that you guys wrote i was gonna say yeah i think there's a as far as the quickness, there's a, there were a couple of factors at play. One was that we didn't have that much money to <laughs> record longer. And also our, um, our producer at the time, Dave Cobb, um, he kind of, together we have this mindset of just like going in and capturing that kind of uh, natural sound just like right off the bat. Um, and he's really big on 
uh, just capturing like what feels right rather than trying to, you know, slaving away to like get it perfect and get the perfect take. It's more about just getting that. Maybe it's the first take that sounds great. Maybe you didn't play it perfect, but you know, that's what's going on the record. And so that takes, it takes less time, but it's kind of freeing in a way. Um, but yeah, with that album, speaking of the band, um, you know, after the first album, there were a lot of songs written, um, you know, with these new relationships with the mandolin and banjo in mind. Um, but as we spent more time together in the van um, and got to know our musical taste and our different inspirations, we really wanted those to shine through because that's, you know, who we are. And we didn't want to be limited by, oh, we should, you know, sound like this because we have a mandolin or a banjo in our band. Like, we should play this kind of music um, when we really love hip hop and we really love rock and Nate loves EDM. And so we wanted to, like, have all these different uh, influences speak through. Um, and so when we approached the album, um, we kind of tried to f flip it around and, you know, not be inhibited by any kind of box. Sure. Um, so that was kind of the inspiration for going in, just speaking honestly, uh, musically <clears throat> and lyrically, and just kind of seeing what happened. Yeah. And I think to like piggyback off that, uh, like we, we as a band, we've always been an indie band in like radio we never really thought radio would be a part of our story. Like, um, it just kind of happened in the last like, um, six months. And, um, so when we wrote records, like it was for the live show because that was what we were doing to like grow and to kind of maintain the ship. And, and our, our live show is like really important to us. We, we like always like going to shows to like, uh, or concerts that we go to. Um, we want to see like, we want to be entertained, you know, like I, I want to, I want to go to a show and not be bored. And if somebody's up there just playing the song or whatever, not interacting with the crowd. It doesn't really connect with me. Um, and so this, like, even like some of the lyrics or whatever in the song, they're kind of sim simplistic in nature just to kind of like ring true on at a live show. Um, Cause that's especially what we were doing at the time to kind of grow. That's great. Um, another question, just since we're at Google, we always try and ask one, somewhat technology based question nothing too hard don't worry about it um we talk a lot about kind of you know the the culmination of the music mixing with technology um things like social media things like selling your music online streaming music um where do you guys kind of stand in this this whole kind of scenario where it comes to either fan interaction um you know, posting videos on YouTube, streaming on, on things like Spotify or Pandora. Do you guys see that as being a huge benefit to you as, as a, a band that's come up in the digital age? Or do you kind of wish there was less of that, more vinyl, more cassettes, things like that, to make things a little bit more physical, more easy on you guys? I think, um, you know, we get asked similar questions to that often. And uh, the age that we grew up, like, I think downloading and streaming became popular when we were in elementary school. And so it's kind of what we've known, I guess, in some ways. And so we hear all the time that people are, especially from record label folks, like they're making less money when people are streaming, but we're just excited that people have access to what we're doing. Um, but with our career, we've always known as like, the way we make money is from live shows. And so, and we're not really to that point at all where we can get upset that I'm almost like, here, just take our music, like, yeah. just spread it around. And um, when we got started, too, we, we gave everything away um, on Noise Trade. I don't know if you, basically, you give it, like, your EP away, and they give you an email in return, and um, it's free, and they can tip if they want. But it's just a way to, I think we got, like, 40,000 emails off our first EP, and that was how we toured at first, was kind of sending out notifications to those people and letting them know we're around. And But, it yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's cool to have... I mean, I have hundreds of CDs at home of all the bands that I love growing up. But um, so in that way, it's cool to appreciate and have a physical thing. But I think we're just glad that people can listen to us and it makes it easy to share. And um, yeah, yeah. My friends make fun of me because I still uh, have a pile of CDs sitting in the passenger seat of my car. I think I'm some old <laughs> school guy, but I like I like. Being able to hold on to my you'll, music. You'll be the like hipster this. in like five years. <laughs> exactly. I'm already working on it, right? Can't wait till CDs are cool again. Start wearing flannel shirts. It'll be perfect. So, <laughs> um, so you mentioned touring is, is huge for you guys. We already kind of touched on the fact of, of your history of touring. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier. You guys are uh, wrapping up kind of your summer tour here towards the end of August, and then you're going off on um, kind of a, another round through the States, and then you're heading over to Europe for 
uh, a lot of dates across the continent. What do you guys hope to get out of that? Um, you know, you talk, we talk about connection with fans and, and kind of growing your fan base and spreading your music. What's your ultimate goal for a, a big tour like that for you guys? I think we've, we've always dreamed of being like an international band and um, just like it worked out to go to Sweden or Scandinavia the first time because this label over there just kind of like had um, a grant, I think even from the government to like bring us over. Um, and so we didn't lose money on that tour. But I think what's, uh, what's hard, difficult for a young band like getting over to Europe is it's, it's really expensive. And um, uh, so we're, we're just hoping to kind of like establish like a foundation, like a little bit what we did um, here in America with just kind of like grassroots, just like we're going over there. We're opening up for a band called Kaleo. They're Icelandic band, they're a really, really cool band. And um, we did a couple of shows with them here in, in Canada in, as well. And so, I don't know, we're, we're just like hoping to uh, get over there and experience different cultures, new people, um, hopefully like bring our music in, uh, into that place so it can be like a place where we continue to go back to and um, connect with. That's awesome. Well, listen guys, we appreciate you coming in to Google Detroit, to Google in general. Uh, the music was fantastic. We wish you guys the best of luck. Uh, it seems like there's huge things coming for you guys, and, and we're really excited to be a part of that journey for you guys. Thank you guys once again for coming in. Yeah, we appreciate thank, it. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.